welcome you back to our series, Cliché Christians. want to welcome our Sepulpa and Kuita campuses. Those of you that are watching online, we're glad to have you aboard for this journey. As we have talked about being cautious in our conversations and the words that we use as Christians. Now, we've talked about the things that we say, but really what we're talking about is, is the way that we, we live as Christians and the things that we believe as Christians. Uh, what we're trying to do is go beyond just superficial Christianity. What we're trying to do is go beyond just being shallow Christians, which is very culturally acceptable in our, our world, but, but moving beyond that, moving to a deeper level. And so we've addressed it in terms of, of things that we say. And so we've talked about over the last couple of weeks uh, just cliches that get used uh, among Christians. And we, we define cliche as this. It's an oversimplification of reality that we use to avoid the uncomfortable facts. It's just easier to say that. It's easier to, to just spit out some words. It's easier just to use an overused phrase than, than it is uh, sometimes to provide something meaningful or something that uh, comes across as having some thought. And so in week number one, we talked about uh, things that we say uh, when we're trying to comfort people. And you know all the phrases that have been mentioned at funerals and have been mentioned at hospital bedsides and things like, the, well, they're in a better place. And well, th this, is, this is all for the good. And, and it must be God's will. And, and, and the list goes on and on of things that just get said and just get repeated by Christians. And while we talked about there's some truth to them, uh, sometimes uh, it's just inopportune, uh, an inopportune time to, to say those particular words. And so we need to be cautious about what we say. And there are things that we can do to help someone when they're hurting uh, that uh, is probably more significant, like being a presence to them, like crying with them, like just validating the loss and, and identifying and recognizing that with them. So that was week number one. Week number two, we talked about things that we say when we want to help. And really what we did was we talked about a whole lot of phrases that just get kind of passed along uh, among church people that uh, are, are, are almost like formulas. If you do this, then this is the outcome. Well, if you'll just go to church or if you'll just read your Bible and pray, if you just had more faith, a, a lot of if-then statements, if you just did more of this, then you would get a better outcome. And and sometimes there's some truth. Sometimes those are good things. It's certainly good for us to read our Bible and to pray. It's certainly good for us to go to church. It's certainly good for us to have more faith. But to make it into a formula uh, it, it is, is probably not the thing that we, we need to do because it disappoints people when the formula doesn't work out. In fact, we, we talked about life is not a formula. Life is an offering. It's something that we do on a regular basis where we get up in the morning and we say, Holy Spirit, I'm going to walk with you today and I want to, my life to honor and to please you today. And we can't live it by some, some pattern, some formula, some spiritualism. In fact, our, our trust is in a God who is worthy of our trust, not in the not in the spiritualisms that we've come across or collected in our, our spiritual toolbox. Well, today I want us to talk a little bit more about things that we say when we're praying, things that we talk about when we're praying, phrases that we use when we're praying. And you know, while we could probably go through a whole lot of them, I thought, well, maybe what we need to do is explain what we mean. Because there are some of you that have not been Christians very long, and maybe you've heard somebody pray and you thought, I have no idea what they're talking about. So this is Greg's guide to uh, some of the spiritual uh, prayer phrases that we use. Like this one right here, often gets used in prayers, and it's pretty generic, and it's just be with, and then put the name in, be with my kids, or be with my wife, or be with my friend. And, and, and what we're doing is we're asking God to just, uh, uh, that his presence just be known there, that, that God's presence would be uh, uh, maybe felt by them. We're praying for God's presence. When we say, God, would you be with we're praying that he's going to be there and work and do something in his life. Or this is one that gets used often, uh, especially in some old-time prayers. We're praying for God to guide, guard, 
and direct. Or maybe another version of it is lead, guide, and direct. And it just gets rattled off, and, and it's almost like a, you know, a, a, a three-point homily right there uh, as a part of our prayers. When somebody says guide, guard, and direct, all they're asking is that God would, in that person's life, whoever they're praying for, that group of people who they're praying for, that God would, would, would give them some direction, that as they're going through a, a process of making decisions or, or as they're, they're working through, uh, uh, walking through life, that God would, would, would provide some uh, uh, visibility of what His will is. And so that, those are some normal things. One of my favorites is just when we talk about an unspoken request. And uh, uh, sometimes it'll come out this way. You'll be in a classroom or, or something, and someone is uh, asking for prayer requests, and people are mentioning their aunt and their uh, co-worker, and somebody will go, I have an unspoken request. And, you know, I always thought it was kind of funny, and then somebody would pray, we pray for all the unspoken requests, and kind of like summarizing them all up. But when we say, when someone says an unspoken request, they're simply just saying uh, something that I think is confidential, something that I probably don't uh, have permission or don't want to necessarily put up in front of people. And so it kind of sounds funny, but, but uh, that's the reason why we do it. Or my, my favorite when we're praying before meals is, bless this food to our bodies. Now really, what, is, what does that mean? Bless this food to our bodies. Well, I'm not sure it necessarily means anything except we're acknowledging that, you know, God, we're praying to you and we're thanking you for this food. Because seriously, if we're asking God to bless this cheeseburger and cheese fries that's, you know, not anything nutri nutritious for us, then that's probably an overstep to ask God to do something good with it inside of our bodies. Uh, that's probably a little much to ask. Sometimes people will ask for travel mercies. That's a term that gets used. God, we're praying for travel mercies for our group or for our family as we're traveling. What are travel mercies? Well, typically people are just saying, well, God, we're, we're praying that they'll arrive safe, that you'll be watching over them while they're, while they're away, while they're traveling, and we're praying, God, that, that you'll take care of them and they'll get there safe. Or one of them sometimes that's confusing for people is when people pray for a hedge a protection around somebody or myself or whatever. God, I'm just praying for a head of, hedge of protection around, around them. And uh, so it's one that we've heard and one that gets sometimes overused. And, and uh, 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 basically it's just saying, God, would you, would you, would you protect? Would you, would you kind of be uh, on a defensive of, of whatever it is? Put, put your arms around. Come around and, and protect uh, whoever it is. Now, the question that I have is, where did, where did the hedge come up from? I, I mean, if, if I'm honest and I'm praying for God to protect me, I'm not wanting just a, like a little bush around me that God's protecting me. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking cement wall. I, I'm thinking, you know, maybe force field. God, I'd like a force field of protection. I'd like, uh, you know, a six-foot concrete wall around me. I don't know where hedge of protection uh, came from, but those are terms that we use, and sometimes they just become a part of our, our, our phraseology, sometimes part of our, our, our speech in times of prayer, and, and we really just repeat them, and, and, and maybe they've lost their value. Now, I believe there's value to us as far as cliches in prayer. I think there is some value to that because many of us learn to pray through some statement or some phrase or something that we learned as a child. God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for our food. Maybe as a child you learned to repeat a prayer like that and it was something where you learned to acknowledge God and to show your gratitude to God before you ate food. I, I think there's some value to that. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. There is great value in a child learning that, that before I close my eyes, uh, I'm going to acknowledge God and I'm going to pray that God is going to watch over me and prepare me for the next day. We, we understand that. We understand that that's helpful to do that. But the problem is, is if we're still saying some of those same prayers, if, 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 if all we do is gotten comfortable with saying repeated prayers, then, then if we're doing that as a, a, a 20-year-old, if that's the only prayer that we know to say, then, then we've got an issue. 
There's value in us repeating prayers. In fact, many of you, that's how you learned to pray as an adult. It was because you listened to other, other people pray. You listened to people that were more mature than you. And you adopted some of their language. You took some of the things that they said and you included it into your prayer vocabulary. And there's nothing wrong with that. But again, if all we're doing is repeating back prayers, we are missing the point of prayer. In fact, nice prayer words, if we're honest, has been what has kept some of you from praying aloud in front of your family or in front of your small group or maybe even in front of a church gathering or, 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 or some holiday meal. You miss the opportunity to connect with God on behalf of a group of people through, the, through prayer because you felt like you didn't know the right language. And so the right phrases and the right prayers have kept some away. You've thought to yourself, well, I, I, I can't say it right. I'm not as eloquent as someone else. I can't, I can't do it right. And that's the danger, I think, of, of saying repeated prayers, cliche prayers, is that they... They come across to other people as this is how you do it correctly. And if you're not saying the right words, then you're not doing it right. And nothing could be farther from the truth because there are no right words. Can we talk about what Jesus had to say about prayer? There was a time in Matthew chapter 6 when he's instructing his disciples how to pray. This is early on in, on in the ministry, and he's, he's kind of given them some direction in how it happens. In fact, there's times where they ask, Lord, teach us to pray. And so Jesus says this, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. Jesus says, in, 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 totally different to that, do this. When you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father who's unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Well, well first off, let's make sure we understand. Jesus is not saying that we're to never pray out loud. That's not the point of this this teaching right here. He's talking about our motivation in, 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 in praying, the reason why that we do that. And, and, and we have to probably understand a little bit about Jewish culture. What they would do is multiple times during the day, they would stop at the assigned time and they would repeat some prayers. The Jews would say some prayers. And according to Jewish custom, no matter where you were at that particular time, you were to stop. It was proper for you to stop. If you were in the middle of the street, if you were you know, uh, uh, in the marketplace, wherever you were, you were to stop and you were to turn towards the temple and pray. Now, apparently what was happening, according to Jesus, is that some hypocrites would plan their day so as to be in an in a conspicuous place so that when it, was in time to, when it was time to pray. And so maybe they would be on some busy street corner. Maybe they would be in the middle of the marketplace. They would be at the city gate. And they would lift up their hands to God and they would display their devotion for everyone who was in proximity to be able to see. And Jesus is expressing his caution about that. In fact, he's saying those people, they love to do it where everybody can see it. They, they, they plan it that way, and they are, they are hypocrites. They are people with two faces. They are people that you know, are, are trying to, to look better than they, they really are. They're trying to be seen by others. And what Jesus says is we need to recognize that those people get their reward. Their reward is that people notice them. People look up to them. People think they're great prayers. People think that they are great spiritual people. But Jesus says that's... That's not the reward that you're looking for. That's really not what you want. They've gotten a reward, but it's not the true reward. And of course, Jesus expresses then what true prayer is. It's, it's a conversation with God. It's something that you do more in a private, more in a personal way. So what's Jesus telling us? I think he's simply saying, be careful of praying with the intention of impressing people. Be careful with uh, praying with the intention of, of impressing people. That's what can be a danger when we pray using 
certain words that get passed on because we can use those words not with the intention of connecting with God or communicating with God, but for the intention of, of impressing people or at least communicating to the people around us that we know how to do this thing, that we are confident in doing this thing, that we can pray, that we know the language, that we know what to say. And Jesus would have strong words of warning for us when we pray, thinking more about the people around us than the one to whom our prayers are intended. Jesus goes on in that very same uh, passage, and he says this, and when you pray, now that's how he started before, when you pray, don't pray like the hypocrites, the religious people that want to look good, and he goes on and says, and when you pray, don't keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. We're going to come back to that verse, because that sounds a little odd right there, but let's talk about what Jesus is saying and how it applies to us when he says, don't pray like the pagans who keep on babbling. And so what you need to know about the pagans of that day is that that's the way that they would pray. In fact, that word that is translated babbling is a word that's used hardly anywhere else in the Bible, not anywhere in the Bible, in fact, hardly anywhere else uh, in, in Greek literature. And uh, it is just kind of a bad a bad a bad a bad it's just a mumbling, it's just a repeating. And when when Jesus says, don't pray like the pagans that keep babbling on. They, they think their prayers are going to be answered by repeated words. They thought there was a formula to getting a God, they were pagans, to getting a God to answer them. And if I just keep repeating things, if I just keep saying some words, if I just keep uttering things, then at some point I'm going to say the right thing that's going to appease this God. I'm going to, I'm going to say the right prayer. I'm going to say the right phrase. And so sometimes that's the way we operate in praying to God. I'm, 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 going, to, I'm going to say things till I say the right word. I'm going to repeat the right phrase. I'm going to forward the email ten times. I'm going to, I'm going to say the prayer and it will be answered. I, it, it, it turns into a formulaic approach to prayer that if I utter the right words, then God is going to answer. But Jesus is clear that God doesn't need to be instructed by lengthy prayers. That's what God needs. In fact, he's going to say God already knows what you need. Did you catch that last phrase? Don't be like them. Here, and here's why. For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So my question is, well, why in the world am I praying then? Maybe that's your question too. If God already knows, why, why is Jesus telling us to tell Him about it? Why are, we, why are we even praying about it? What difference does it even make? And here's what Jesus is telling us, that the reward isn't that God will answer all your prayers. That's, that's not the reward of praying. That's not why we pray. The reward is that when I finish my prayers, I leave with the assurance that God is with me, that I can face the uncertainty of the day and the unknown of the future, and that I can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is with me. That passage right there, not telling us not to pray, but it's calling for simplicity and directness and sincerity in connecting and talking with God. Don't keep on babbling like the pagans. The old Revised Standard Version says this, don't heap up empty phrases. That may be the most significant thing that could be said for our culture. Don't heap up empty phrases. Phrases. The message says this, uh, uh, calls it formulas. Don't, don't try to turn your prayers into some kind of formula. So what's Jesus trying to tell us here? Be careful of praying with the intention of managing God. Not only am I to be careful that I pray uh, and, and who it is that I'm trying to impress, I don't want to impress people with my prayers, and and my goal of praying is not to try to manipulate or maneuver God, to, to say the right thing so that God is compelled to respond in some way. That's not the goal of praying. And again, that, that, can, be, that can be the caution for us of praying 
with certain phrases, that we be cautious that we're not trying to say the correct thing, the, the, the pattern, the, the formula, the, the right code that God somehow is going to respond to that. Instead, Jesus' next words are very simple. He says, this then is how you should pray. And Jesus then is going to deliver and set for the apostles the Lord's Prayer, maybe more appropriately the model prayer for this, for, for his disciples, for his followers. And basically, this is how you should go about doing it. Now, Jesus is not saying, pray these words. As he says the, the Lord's Prayer, he's not saying, use this word, use this pattern. And the truth is, we we have simply taken what Jesus said when he said pray like this and we've taken it very literally and we've prayed those words. Not a thing wrong with repeating the Lord's Prayer. But that's not Jesus' intention of getting us to repeat prayers. He's saying pray like this. In other words, this is how you should pray. Jesus is saying that it ought to be thoughtful. It, 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 ought to be, it ought to be clear. It, it ought to be something that is, 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 is thought through. It should not just be shallow. It should not be insincere. But it should be approached carefully. In fact, what I think Jesus is saying through all of this is that what God really wants in our prayers is authentic conversation. That's what God really wants. Jesus favors, God favors our prayers that are personal. Go into the closet and, and, and come before the Father. Be honest, be sincere, be personal. And so that's why Jesus would, when he starts that prayer, our Father who art in heaven. We know it is the, the Lord's Prayer, but I want you to notice that Jesus starts it that way. Our Father. Now, he could have told us to cry out many things ultimate creator of the universe, supreme being, almighty life force. But that's not what God is looking for. God wanted something more personal for Him and for us. And so Jesus modeled it for us by beginning His prayer, addressing God as our Father. And isn't that what God has wanted from the very beginning? He's wanted a very personal relationship, an intimate relationship with his prized creation. He's wanted it from the beginning of time. And it may be possible that for all of your life, you have, you, God has been anything but personal to you. God has been just some supernatural force out there. God has been just some great, mighty being out there and has not been something that you could ever conceive of having some kind of relationship or connection with. It doesn't have to be casual. It's not what Jesus was, is saying. It doesn't have to be improper. It doesn't have to be irreverent. For it to be, for it to be personal. The Father God wants to have a relationship with you, His creation. He wants nothing more than to, to meet His prized creation. And prayer is a vehicle by which we do that. More importantly than praying so that we get our way or get what we want, what God really wants is, is to connect with you and you to walk away knowing that the God of the universe is on your side and you can trust Him. Father, we thank You for giving us prayer. What an amazing thing for us to be able to communicate with the Creator God. And Father, we are grateful for, for your desire to be in, a, be in a relationship with us. And for God, Father, forgive us when we have turned prayer into some ritual, to some pattern, some formula of correct words to say, and have turned it away from what you really want. And so God, help us to be people who pray to you and do it in a way that is a part of an authentic relationship. God, help us to be people that move beyond cliches and shallowness and superficial Christianity.
God, we want to be people who know you and are known by you. We pray it in Jesus' name.